Hello and welcome to Critical Line Item. My name is Tom Rambler. Thank you so much for joining me for this particular podcast. Now, some of you will know I wrote a book not so long ago on Crown Casino and its troubles. And the book's called Crown Playing in the Shadows. And I've had a long interest in regulation and how regulation works. There is a problem, though, uh, when we talk about regulation of any industry. Never you mind about casinos. We talk about the people think regulators do a lot more than they are actually enabled to do. And this is one of the rare occasions, this particular podcast, one of the rare occasions where I talk to one of the regulators involved in dealing with one part of regulating um, interesting business like sort of casinos and, and, and clubs and uh, others. I'm joined by uh, Fran Thorne, who is the Commissioner of the Victorian Casino Control and Gaming Regulator. I think I've got that right. They change names a lot, these guys. And what we're going to do is talk about Yes, Crown and some controversies and what they've had to deal with in a little while, but you need to understand what the regulator does first. Because unless you understand how the regulator's pitch is drawn, you don't have, you don't have any idea about how the game is played. Rand, thank you so much for making time to join me today. Thank you, Tom, and thank you for inviting me. Now, that absolute pleasure. Now, before we begin, there'll be those who only heard of you uh, when you've made announcements at press conferences about the various things, or they've seen media releases on your website, which we'll point them to later. Um, how would you describe your career to somebody who's never met you before? Um, I am uh, have worked both in public and private sector, the longest time in the public sector. And if you looked at what I did, you pretty much say I was someone who looked out for the hardest and trickiest parts of government to work in. So education, health, um, uh, environment, uh, only a small time in environment. Um, and uh, I'm really interested in the very, very big problem that a gov the government's face in setting up big service systems where they literally lay, where people literally lay their hands on you, and in some of, in one of them, they stick knives into you um, under law, um, and how you organise that, how you create change in that, how you um, help them to be systems that are self-improving over time. Um, they're very comp so very so you know in a nutshell. If it's difficult, I'd always say yes if someone asked me if I was interested in doing it. And the latest one is just another example of that. Now, in my introductory comments, I referred to uh, the scope of regulatory activity and the fact that it's not always apparent to people what a regulator does. Um, the best person to talk about the scope of regulatory activity is the regulator themselves. Um, how does your legislation work? What is it that you you do in its most fundamental? All right. Form? Can I just start, Tom, by prefacing that by saying what very rapidly describing what the industry is that's being regulated? Because yep. lots of people just think it's the casino um, or you know the latest local pub that has a few pokies in it. So essentially the industry is made up of, you know, about 500 gambling venues, which includes the casino and all those pubs and clubs um, across the state. There okay. are about 730 wagering and betting agents, so that's on course um, and other forms of betting. There are seven, about 790 lottery agents. There are about 600 kino outlets. Um, and then there are about 6,000 what are called gaming activities, which include things like raffles and bingo. So it's everything from the very pointy end, very sharp big end of something like the casino to your local raffle, um, which might be raising something for a charity. 
So you're talking about a very diverse industry. Um, there are a couple of licenses that the government actually awards uh, through very extensive processes that generally take a couple of years. Um, the casino license is one, the tote, um, TAB is the other, the lottery licenses, there are two Kino licenses, and then there's Interlot, which is a monitoring um, agency that kind of collects data and monitors, monitors machines and does all those things. We then do what you would call the licensing of everything else in that industry I just described. So, you know, um, and essentially what we license are people, um, those who are what we would call an associate. So they'll be, you know, essentially the management generally um, of an uh, organisation that's going to provide betting services or the okay. workers inside that service. Um, and that's not all workers, but it's workers who are providing um, gambling products. What we also do um, is approve the products. So if you want to introduce a new game in the casino or a new type of um, AGM or some weird new form of raffle or whatever, uh, we would have to approve that. Um, and that includes even looking inside those machines um, at the technology, how they're designed, will they meet all the standards? All of this is done, so that's the licensing side. And then of course we oversight the licenses. So that's where we do, where we supervise the activities um, of the industry to make sure that the industry is operating within the law and the terms of their license. And so all of this, as you have rightly said, is surrounded by a body of law. Um, and the acts that surround or um, hold the regulation of this industry probably amount to more pages um, for this industry than any other industry in Victoria. So there's probably close on 2,000 pages of law associated with the gambling industry. So there's the Gambling Act, the Casino Control Act, the Casino Management Agreement Act, the Victorian Casino and Gambling Control Commission Act. So there's a whole bunch of acts. Um, and within that is the essentially the legal framework within which either we run our systems or all the licensing, licensing operators um, have to operate. So by and large, if you put it in a nutshell, um, what you say where the parts that we're responsible for is saying who's suitable to okay. be an operator and therefore who's unsuitable if they don't operate properly um, and what are the products. We do also oversight a small amount of the marketing um, and that is and essentially the state of play in Victoria around marketing is that very, very little marketing is allowed. So um, you, know, you cannot advertise pokies, for example. You call pokies like the pain, plain package part of the industry. Um, they can have a sign that is of a certain size and a certain look, um, and that's it. They cannot do any other advertising. There's a bit of advertising that might happen over roads, but not much. Um, you can't advertise near school. So advertising gambling in Victoria, which is ter what you'd call terrestrially based, i.e. in person, on not online, um, uh, there's very little of it that is allowed. Advertising online is primarily the responsibility of the Commonwealth, not the state, and it's covered by the community. I can't remember the exact title, but it's something like the Communications Act. Um, so, you know, it's a, it's a big industry. There's lots of law around it, and there's a very good reason why there's lots of law, because the reason this is a regulated industry is it is understood that there is potential harm associated with it. And those harms are both the infiltration of criminal activity um, and associated criminal activity that might occur, dangers that might occur to people who use um, gambling products, um, the importance of having gambling products that are not that are legal and not tampered with. Um, and then there is a very new um, requirement that we have that we're delighted to have, which is actually to, um, to regulate for harm minimisation. So it's a bit now an explicit objective in our act 
that uh, that's only been there, I think, since the middle of the year, um, which is we are to minimise gambling harm and problem gambling. So it's a new and really big area for us that we're excited to take on board. There are a couple of things that are probably worth expanding on. Um, uh, there are, as you said, there's a scope of activity that's broad. Um, your local raffle, <laughs> as well as your, as well as the, you know, the monstrosities that need to be dealt with in big buildings on the era. But the uh, one of the issues that strikes me in thinking about that, that enormous laundry list is um, when, when you come across something that sits outside your purview, you, know, you, you may be in a position to say, Tick up an associate, or look at see whether somebody um, somebody is suitable to participate in a gambling enterprise. But there would also be circumstances, and correct me if I'm wrong, where you need to uh, liaise with other authorities because something falls outside the boundaries that the, your legislation sets for you. We have a perfect case that exemplifies that point you're making, Tom, going at the moment. There's a lot I can't talk about because it's in process, but I can talk about the things around it which go to the point you're making. Um, and that is a case that's being um, followed at the moment against the Greyhounds pub, which is in the southeastern suburbs of Melbourne. The VGCCC identified through its monitoring and oversight system that there were a range of activities taking place at this pub that, you know, shrieked money laundering. So they were, you know, if this place was issuing more checks than most people were issuing, they were being issued to a relatively small number of people. All of these were, and some other things, were signs that said there is suspicious activity going on. Money laundering is a federal issue. So we identified Austrac and... Uh, sorry, I went to Austrac and said, we think, oh, not absolutely sure, but we think there is something going on here that looks like money laundering. And we and Austrac worked together to do an investigation into this. And I won't talk about that either, um, but, you know, it, it involved your normal investigative processes. Um, and then Austrac, ourselves, and the AFP, um, joined together on the actual raid on the um, on the premises and the AFP take over the role then of charge, sorry, the Australian Federal Police, um, of charging, laying okay. the charges and prosecuting the charges. So that's a really nice example where um, the location of the problem or the alleged problem um, is uh, a venue that we regulate. We are dead, but the actual issue is covered by laws that are managed elsewhere, um, and in this case, um, at the federal level. Uh, and we have a pretty good relationship uh, with Austrac, and um, we work very closely with them to really progress this because um, it was, you know, it appeared very a very a clear contra contravention. Um, but it took quite a long time to establish the evidence, and um, but it was a joined at the hip type of activity. And then, as I said, the AFP has to come in because they're the body that has the ability to charge uh, or lay the charges and then progress them. In association with that, depending on where these charges go, the commission may itself then take disciplinary action against the venue. Um, and that will be disciplinary action that relates back to whether or not they have contravened their licence arrangements mm -hmm. or yeah. the Act. So if they have been, you know, doing something that's, if they have knowingly 
um, and this is not yet determined, but if the, the venue had knowingly allowed this to happen, then we would have grounds uh, for taking disciplinary action against them as a venue licensee for that action. We tend to wait when there are criminal charges pending. We would tend to wait because we don't want to do anything that would, you know, make that those charges um, hard to progress. Uh, uh, but we would then at some stage make a decision uh, if it's found to be the case to consider. And, and the things we would consider would range from, um, you know, issuing, issuing a warning notice uh, to removing their licence to operate. One of the uh, issues that come uh, that this point you've just raised uh, also brings to my mind is that when you look at an issue related to uh, people complying with licensing conditions, that's, if I understood this correctly, is the scope of your decision making, yes. whether there's suitable directors of an entity, for example, or whether there's action that needs to be taken in relation to other legal responsibilities they may have under other legislation, say it's the Corporations Act, that falls into the bailiwick of the Australian Securities and Investments Commission. That's correct. So we might say, we can say that, an, say, a a hypothetical gaming operator has behaved most egregiously um, and, you know, their board have been asleep at the wheel. Yeah. We might say, our role would be say, are, do they continue to be suitable associates? Are they suitable to hold that licence? Yeah. And that would be the frame within which we would look at it it would be the role of ASIC to say whether as directors they had broken or, or been, um, you know, operating not in accordance with the Corporations Act. Uh, so we, and I was asked this question recently, you know, isn't this outrageous that all these people at Crown, for example, and this was asked in a press conference, you know, they've all left and there is no, you know, they're, they're not going to be punished. Um, and it's very hard to get across in those circumstances, but our Act doesn't allow us to punish them once they are no longer an associate. We can punish them, and I don't want to use the you know, we can we can manage their and monitor their behaviour um, and bring sanctions against them by removing their licence to operate within the industry. But if they've already exited the industry, then it becomes either the role of ASIC or if they've been criminal, for one of the law enforcement agencies to take that action up. But there's an analogous circumstance that will probably help listeners to this uh, understand it, and that is you know, if I take talk briefly about tax regulation, um, there will be people who are uh, members of a professional body, but they're also registered as tax agents. Yeah, they may resign their membership of a professional body. Yes. And the professional body can't take any action against them because the only, the biggest penalty they can hit somebody with in, in many respects is the rescinding of a membership. Exactly. Whereas, you know, a tax regulator would be able to take other uh, action that would impair someone's ability to earn an income, like actually, you know, ensure that they lose their tax registration. Yes. Um, they did a document that allows them to basically print money as a tax advisor. It's, it's, uh, it's sort of similar. Um, the only kind of caveat I'd put on that is if you take away someone's licence to operate in the gambling industry, you are actually taking something quite generally quite substantial away from them in terms of financial rewards. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, the, um, and that, that we will get to reasonably soon, no doubt. Um, uh, I'm also going to ask you, uh, how how frustrating it must be to to answer questions about what you do and not do when you when you when you <laughs> when you're confronted by the media in that respect. But you've already touched on that. 
it, it, it is frustrating, Tom, but I can also understand why people ask that. So, it, you know, I can, I, I and any other regulator who gets up and says, the limits of my power are this and I can't do this, really, I can, I, I can see how people respond to that. I can understand that. But it's the facts. I, you know, I might wish that I could pursue people to the nth degree, but I don't have the power under the law to do that. Um, and no regulator does. Every regulator in this country is generally set up with a very bounded space in which they can operate and uh, woe betide, betide them if they step beyond that space. And that's why it's really, I think, important for regulators to have kind of very good relationships so that they're, um, yeah, they, as far as possible, work um, work collectively around complex issues. But having said, so it is very frustrating because you know you're going to sound like you're just making excuses, but it's facts. It's not excuses. It is the it is the fact. It's a limitation. Of um, uh, I, I guess the other the other uh, issue there is. Um, and, and I know you understand why they might ask that question, but uh, looking at it as a practitioner um, of uh, in the media space, I would probably expect people to um, try and comprehend the scope well, of regulatory. <laughs> but that's a that's a separate matter that altogether. Because in this case, when I was asked, it was clear the person who asked the question knew the answer. <laughs> the, I guess it, it, it's a convenient point to sort of segue into uh, the decisions that were most recently announced and more recently I mean, over the past you know, eight or nine months that relate specifically to uh, Crown Casino. Um, the first of these, uh, some months ago now, uh, was the, the one that resulted in, in Crown copying what at that time was a fairly hefty fine um, of $80 million, looking at some transactions that were, um, to paraphrase the matter, um, untoward. Uh, how did you land on that decision? Um, it would be lovely to say um, that the law provides a science for this, uh, but it doesn't. There are many things uh, you really have to take into account when you're making a decision about what is the appropriate action, and that's taking into account the relative, relevant and circumstances around what happened, um, any mitigations that there might be about... Uh, what they did at the time or what have what they have done subsequently, um, uh -huh. the level of deterrence that might be um, uh, might, might be useful in this, and that's been the subject of um, recent cases uh, in the corporate world that in the end provided um, uh, we felt very good guidance to the commission um, around the issue of deterrence. And um, in this case, uh, Crown had cooperated with the Commission in providing, it wasn't a precise estimate, but it was their best estimate and they got um, someone from outside to work with them to work out what the estimate of profit was. Um, and that was used as the basis. There was then a deterrence factor um, and a factor of that took into account the circumstances at the time and we arrived at um, $80 million. Uh, so, but deterrence was a particularly important issue here but, and, and was helped, as I said, by very recent case law that got to the point that said deterrence had to be something that was sufficient to stop an organisation from seeing the result of any form of prosecution being merely part of the cost of doing business. So okay. in the past, the Commission could only levy a $1 million fine. Now, for many of the organisations we regulate, if we went that far, uh, and that doesn't apply to all of them, it was only applied, that one actually applied to Crown, um, but for many organisations, a million dollars would be a lot of money, but not 
not to an organization like Crown. I'm not saying it's inconsequential, but a million dollars in a in a business that's you know heading up to two billion dollars isn't a lot of money. So that whole issue of um, being approaching it more than to say this is something that you cannot just write off as the cost of doing business and say I'm going to potentially keep doing this because the cost to me as a business is so low. Um, so that issue of deterrence, both mm-hmm. the Crown um, and the um, uh, and the industry more broadly um, uh, were very important considerations for the Commission. The Commission didn't make the decision lightly. Um, many hours were spent by the Commission um, considering uh, all the relevant circumstances um, and considering, uh, you know, how do we how do we use this new power, um, and um, what is what is a valid valid amount? And Crown had made quite a lot of money out of it. It was it was also quite you know it was some of the circumstances around it. You know, Crown knew uh, have reason to believe you know that it had internal legal advice. It said this is probably not you know probably not right. You should speak to the commission. None of that happened. So there's a whole bunch of behaviours around how it was done. If you read our um, our, our decision, um, I'd like to say that I said recently that that it wasn't, they aren't page turners, but in fact, they're quite interesting reading. Um, and they give you a very detailed walkthrough of how we came to the decision that what factors we took into account, what mitigation there was, and uh, what did we think was going to say to Crown and anyone else in the industry who thought they might think this was a clever idea that they should do, don't do this again. One of the things that uh, was said in the Royal Commission report, um, and also I guess it uh, possibly linked to that decision was the conduct of advisors and and the, the way in which people and you've just said, I guess I'm rephrasing what you've just said, Fran, um, the way in which people uh, weigh the risk of regulatory action um, and then you know, either being caught or, or the regulatory uh, action being so severe that you, know, you shouldn't go there. Um, is some of that also trying to change internal culture so that those providing advice are also wary of um, going down the road of saying, can we, as opposed to should we? Should we? Yeah. Um, uh, Well, certainly, you know, the commission, the... The commission in making this decision is really looking at at deterrence, and deterrence has a number of of facets. One of which is so financially painful you're not going to do it again. Mm-hmm. But the other facet might be it does make you stop and think about um, you know how you're doing how you're doing your business, and and that was part of also considering Crown's response when we issued a request for information on this and and the way in which they cooperated, which showed an entirely different set of behaviours than those that had um, uh, fostered the environment in which CUP activities took a happen. But the other, other matters that sit at the back of our mind, certainly at the moment when we're looking at the Royal Commission um, taking action on the findings of the Royal Commission, is that the Commission at the moment doesn't have two of its powers available to it. So... Um, we can't suspend or cancel their licence uh, when it comes to matters arising from the Royal Commission. So they've been given a two-year, um, you know, state of grace in which they, having made lots of promises that they would fix things, um, uh, so they've been given two years along with a special manager to make sure they bring themselves to um, appropriate suitability again. And as part of that, therefore, the commission can't say we will use our ultimate sanction against you, which is 
So you take that into account as well when you're when you're considering the fine because yeah. the matters that arose in the Royal Commission, probably not all of them, um, but the, you know, and maybe I'm not so sure, you know, the CUP, definitely the um, uh, responsible gambling matters are matters that the Commission has said in its decisions if it were in a position unconstrained by anything else, where it probably would have considered, seriously considered cancellation of licence because they're so big mm -hmm. and so particularly responsible gambling, so had you know so much detrimental impact. The um, I was about to touch on the responsible gambling decision, which was the second one when you had the China Union Pay decision which was the $80 million fine. Um, and for those who don't know about it, there's a decision on the website, which we'll give you later. It goes into detail as to what Crown uh, uh, did to facilitate money flows to Crown uh, in relation to that. The other one, uh, responsible gambling, ended up costing, well, ended up coming to a what well, the record fine, if I recall correctly, of 120 million, um, and that's uh, that's an eye-watering number for, for those of us whose bank accounts don't uh, don't sort of extend beyond a few ten, a few thousand dollars. But in terms of the responsible service of gambling, uh, what are a couple? What are the the, the core? Uh, problems that you needed to address there? Okay. Um, the core problems, mm, it's a very complex issue, but the core problems are probably, you can probably boil down them, boil them down to the question of the steps that Crown took to um, ensure that patrons who use their gambling facilities did not gamble for excessive lengths of time. So the Royal Commission finding is not responsible gambling per se. It's a finding about what they call their play periods policy, which is an element and a very significant element of responsible gambling. So, yep. um, and also the, the PICS finding. So it's actually two fines that add up to 120 million. Um, and in both cases, certainly in the um, play periods fine, which was $100 million, that boils down to the fact that Crown didn't even follow its own policy and its own policy is deemed, was deemed by the um, commission to be woefully inadequate. So it had a policy of, you know, intervening, i.e. with people, you know, chatting to people about whether they should be, you know, continuing to gamble um, at various points. Um, uh, from 12 to 24 hours. Now, quite frankly, I don't think anyone would think gambling straight for 12 hours, much less 24, much less stories that came out of the Royal Commission of three days straight um, is considered a reasonable policy. Uh, and so even with one that was had as much leeway as, you know, the 12-hour period, they didn't intervene. And um, as a result of that, it is to be presumed um, that uh, many people suffered at the least financial damage, um, but nothing to say with what it might have done to their family relationships or relationships with friends and, um, you know, their own health and uh, all sorts of consequences that are associated with um, either being encouraged to or being addicted to play for mm -hmm. extended periods of time. So that was the core issue, it was a failure of their duty of care to their clients um, and, in particular, a failure to adhere to their own policy around that. Uh, I'm aware we're, we're coming close to, uh, to, to time. Um, and a couple, two more things just to wrap up on. One of the issues that it will obviously be in people's minds because of the public pronouncements of uh, from the Royal Commission and and and, um, and the government uh, is that 
you know, the special manager needs to report in to you. Um, and the we're, we, we're, at, we're at the halfway mark. Um, and it's not that far away before, you know, things need sort of happen. What is the, what is the process uh, that, that will happen at, sort of in the next 12 months in terms of the reporting to you with respect to uh, the, the Crown to you period? Yeah. The process is very simple in one respect. The special manager reports to the, com to the commission um, and to the minister every six months. And it's a progress report on how Crown again, going against remediation. Um, we're not necessarily required to do anything about those reports um, until at such time as we get to the end of the two year period. Okay. Where the commission will have 90 days to make a decision about whether Crown has um, achieved, essentially achieved suitability and the Commission has to be um, satisfied that Crown has achieved suitability. Um, and these are all high bars and, and um, difficult, you know, they're big legal decisions. Um, so what the Commission is doing, uh, Will, over the next 12 months, it, uh, is working to make sure the Commission is A, ready to make the decision, so has all the material it will need to make a decision, and this includes um, the special manager reports and the results of any investigations that we have ourselves um, worked on um, uh, about Crown in the meantime. We will have thought through our, our kind of decision-making framework. Um, and the other thing we need to be prepared for is what I call the Plan B, um, which is, a no, you know, because the decision is either yes or no. Um, and so we um, are very aware that when we get to 1 January, we can't be in the similar position that Commissioner Finkelstein found himself in, which is um, I've got to make a decision here. And this is a business that many people enjoy using. Um, it employs thousands of people and many businesses are dependent upon it. And mm -hmm. if we shut it down tomorrow, then it's going to be total chaos. Um, and people will lose jobs and potentially lose businesses and all sorts of things like that. So it's an incredibly difficult decision for Com Commissioner Finkelstein to make. We want to be in a position where we have ready to go the step in of a new casino operator. So we won't have the, we won't be saying, oh, we can't make the decision because all these people are going to make their, lose their jobs. We will be free to make one or other decision because we have got ready, essentially stepping in kind of like an administrator, because we won't be, our decision isn't to shut the casino. It's a decision about the suitability of the current operator of the casino. Yeah. Uh, no one has said you make a decision to shut the casino. So we have to be ready. And in effect, the Act says we, the Commission essentially steps in as the manager. Now, I don't particularly want to be directly managing the casino. So we will be working what we need to do to have someone or some organisation ready to step in to manage it, uh, to assure people that they will not be losing their jobs, that those business contracts will be um, honoured and that the businesses will continue to continue to operate for what will probably be would pro based on um, recent licensing decisions at least a two-year period to appoint a new casino operator so you have to you have to be ready to say yes or no and um, we are planning to be we don't know what the answer is yet and we will not know um, until those 90 days following um, the last special manager report. Um, and at that point, we will consider suitability and, um, you know, the extent to which we think that they are sufficiently suitable and which is a plan A, yes, plan B, no. And that is going to, uh, that sort of paints a, an, an interesting but busy picture over the next 12 months for you, Fran. <laughs> I have been talking to uh, Fran 
Thorne, who was the chair of the Victorian Casino Control and Gaming Regulator. Um, where do people go if they want to learn more about what you do? Okay, um, the best place is to go to our website. Um, and if you want a quick and easy guide to what we do, um, our annual report is um, you know, generally a place to go that tells you a bit about the environment and the kind of things we've done. If you are really interested in the decisions and the decision-making processes of the Commission, we publish all our decisions. So the two decisions around Crown are both on our website. Um, yep. Any decision that the Commission makes as a tribunal, so any application for electronic gaming machine or pokey licences, they all get published. So um, our decision making is in the public domain. Have a bit of a uh, jump on Google, jump on Bing, whatever your favourite search engine is, and look. Ggccc.vic.gov.au, and that's where you will find Fran and her friends at the Commission. Fran, thank you so much for joining me. Thank you.